Thank you guys so much for being here early uh, and coming to the first session. I almost never make the first session, so thank you. The first thing is, how many of you are new to VR just starting maybe in the last year? Wow, that's fantastic. So then there are a lot of things that maybe you'll learn from this presentation that others might know, so I'll make sure that uh, it's, you know, I, I address everything. So as Gordon mentioned, my name is Stephanie Yamas. I'm the Director of Research and Insights over at Superdata Research. I also head all of our VR AR initiatives. And Superdata is the leading provider of market intelligence for digital games and gaming media, esports, gaming video content, and VR. And actually with VR, we cover the entire landscape, not just games. Um, a lot of the ways that we're able to come to our conclusions is data-based. So we have partners that provide uh, transaction data and data on unique users. And then also, um, we look at the markets qualitatively with a consumer panel of 71,000 consumers. Oh, there we go. And we are very proud to announce that we just launched our VR data network. So we have partnered up with um, a number of key stakeholders, uh, headset makers, software developers such as CCP, um, to bring together all of the data that we can in such a nascent marketplace and give actionable insights. So if you have any questions about this, um, I'd be happy to discuss it with you. Just find me after the talk. So I want to start with the basic landscape. Maybe you've seen some of these numbers that we've put out. Um, we've taken a look at not just the VR market, but augmented reality and mixed reality. So we really believe that there's going to be a, a, a convergence between the three, or rather augmented and virtual, to create this really unique platform, which we call mixed reality. And that is something that might develop you know, a little bit slower than the way we're seeing VR develop, because VR development is so rich right now and there are so many headsets in the marketplace, whereas augmented reality is still finding its place, um, still developing, and so until the two can come together, um, we're just kind of seeing this, this slow and steady growth. But one thing to note is that VR, AR, and MR still have a ways to go before we'll see mass consumption. I'm sure you've heard that a thousand times, and it's true. So, there are, you know, in media history, there are a number of examples of different media that have developed in exactly the same way, in exactly the same way that we're looking at virtual reality, whether it's color TV, whether it's PC, whether it's internet. You have the gap of disillusionment, which is where we are now and which is where we'll stay for a few years, and then a very quick growth. That's something that we'll see, I would say, in about 10 years, where we see that real boom in the meantime, it's about educating people about what the product is and what the experience is, and having developers and industry stakeholders and people like you bringing the medium to life and putting it in the hands of the consumers. So we do see really significant growth in the future, and this is not just consumer-based. This is based on enterprise, um, based on so software licensing, so this is a very big number, but in terms of how many factors are included, it still shows some slow growth to start. So we do see it expanding uh, by $28 billion, or 11 times the amount that we see now, which is about $3 billion um, for both hardware and software. And part of that slow growth, as you know, is discovery. So the user base is quite small at the moment, at least in terms of monthly uniques. There, throughout the year, are likely more than 16 million people who have tried VR. But because of the novelty of a lot of the devices that have been uh, you know, introduced to them, it might have been a one-time experience. And we're seeing this quite a bit. So to start on a monthly basis, we only see about 16 million people experiencing VR. But by 2020, with the emergence of different mobile devices, um, with the great success we've seen from Samsung Gear VR and the anticipated success that we see with Google Daydream, that's going to be the main driver of growth to 2020 where we get to 130 million unique users. So during that time, what's going to be key is 
understanding how to get people into headsets. That's the first thing. So here we have the shipment numbers for the top five uh, or most notable five devices at the moment. Google Daydream, it's a slow start because of just the Pixel being the only compatible phone for the Daydream and um, the, the emergence of Android Nougat. Um, we're not quite there yet. But if you think about the, the mobile cycle, the device cycle of a consumer being about a year and a half to two years before they upgrade, 2017 is going to be the year of Daydream. It's a device agnostic headset that is, it has a, a controller that's a great controller. It's highly functional, it's great quality, and it's using new technology in a really interesting way, bringing on great developers. So right now, you know, 261,000 is in the lot. 2017, we'll see that grow significantly. But this year, the mobile winner has been Samsung Gear VR. As the first uh, entrant into mobile VR, into high-end mobile VR, uh, we've seen quite a bit of interest at 2.3 million, um, million shipments this year. And a lot of that has to do with just the, the, the expansive um, marketing that Samsung has done, really trying alongside Oculus to get people to understand that VR is really significant and getting it into the hands of consumers to try. Now, among the high-end devices, so console and PC devices, this is actually a very great number of shipments if you think about the manufacturing um, setbacks that, that these companies are dealing with. If you think about the install bases of the, you know, first, um, the, the first users of, of new technologies and media. So seeing these numbers is actually extremely promising. I mean, we're talking about extremely uh, expensive headsets that require expensive hardware, and then on top of that, buying software. So the, the biggest issue that we're seeing with these numbers is not necessarily on the part of the manufacturer, right? There are barriers to adoption, the main one being that the consumer has to decide that they want to experience VR. Until they decide that, until they're given the headset and they make the key decision to put that headset on, they don't understand what it is. It's an experience. It's not like walking by two TVs, one is 4K, one is a run-of-the-mill, you know, standard TV. You can see that difference passively. Consumers need to be proactive about this, and you can't force their hand. So there have been a lot of efforts on the part of manufacturers to put demos in, um, in different stores. I saw at JFK there was an Oculus demo booth um, the, the accessibility to these demos is growing and growing and growing, which is fantastic. But it still requires getting people inside the store and for them to say, yes, put this headset on me. So that's one of the, the biggest barriers to entry. The second is when you put on a complex device like the PlayStation VR, the Vive, or the Oculus, you need someone to stand there with you and explain it to you put it on, and get you in the right place. The biggest thing is that for mass consumption, you need to teach non-gamers to use gamer-like controllers. And if you're not a gamer, or you've seen someone who's not a gamer try to handle a game controller, it's, it's another world for them. It's really difficult. If you're a gamer, it's second nature. But if not, we're trying to bring this, this device that's brand new to all of these people who have no idea how to use it. And so you need people who can teach them enough so that they can actually experience it themselves and have agency in that experience. Content is also extremely key. The first experience that you have in VR is the most significant experience you will have the rest of your life. And that's because that's the moment where you decide whether or not VR is something you want to invest in. If you put the headset on, you have knowledgeable assistance, you've heard great things, you've used gaming controllers, you can you know, work that touch like right away. If you're playing something or you're watching something that isn't interesting, that isn't going to make you physically feel different and emotionally captivate you, 
it's going to take you substantially longer to come back around than it would for a new consumer. Putting someone the first time that they put on a VR headset into an experience that's compelling is key. So after you get past these initial hurdles, you have that hurdle as well. And then price, I'm, you know, I don't think I have to go too far into this. It's obviously prohibitive for the, the mass consumer um, for high-end devices. Mobile devices are going to be a great way to, to bring people inside of VR, but it's also difficult to explain to mobile users that high-end devices and mobile devices are two different worlds. So that's going to be a difficult thing to, to get consumers to understand that when they put on that gear or that daydream, it's fantastic, but it gets so much better. You have to spend a lot more money, though. And then awareness and interest. So previously, I put up a graph like this for one of my other presentations, and it was half and half. The reason being that um, it was based on awareness, mostly. So half of people were aware, half of people weren't. Now we're looking specifically at interest. And what's interesting in our research is that interest is somewhat declining. That's not a bad thing. That's actually helping understand and focus on the right consumers. Because the initial interest was, oh, I put on a cardboard. It was really cool. Two months later, you completely forget what that's like. So sure, you might have been interested in February, but now it's like, I'm not going to spend all that money. I'm not going to spend all that time. I don't even know what the difference is. So the fact that interest is slightly declining is actually good news for you. When you are able to tap into the consumer insights and understand who is the specific consumer who's going to pay that money, who's going to buy that phone or buy that console, that's going to be key. So that's something that we're looking into actively, specifically with our data network, but we've been tracking with consumer insights. Fortunately, I don't have the time to delve into that because I could talk about that for hours. But you know, it's something that I'm happy to talk to you about for hours afterwards. And it's really, really compelling to see how that growth is happening. So identifying software revenue, I think you know, most people probably, if they had to guess, would see a ratio similar to this. So we have $407 million in software revenue this year, the ratio being 72% gains. That's easy. We understand it. We understand why. It's because there are more games than anything else out there, and they're monetizable in a straightforward way through premium purchase and a few with in-app purchases. Then you have media and entertainment. This spans across many different things. So this could be just purchasing um, an experience that ties into uh, an episode. There have been, there's been advertising content that's been by brands but also sold. So it's, it's a whole slew of different things that there, there's not a clear monetization model for. And then attractions is 11% because we're starting to see this, this entry of VRcades, especially in China, which is, which is very promising because that's something that helps get consumers to be proactive. And we're going to see more and more of that across the, the whole world. In the West, we're starting to see a lot of uh, different attractions like this. Theme parks are getting more and more interested in including VR into their rides and attractions. So to start with, this is a great entry point for consumers, and it's already making a significant amount of software revenue. And then there are other things like productivity or you know, wellness or, or smaller things like that that are not making so much right now because of monetization, but will grow. So, as I mentioned, right now with games, it's the premium model. There, there's really not an understanding yet how the virtual user is interacting with a game enough to understand where they're going in terms of spending their money. And that's something that we're currently looking at and finding out slowly through the data and the experiences that we ping different consumers on. Um, but it's a long ways off before we're going to see premium go away or freemium or anything like that come to play, maybe we won't see freemium. Maybe that's not the right thing for this. The one thing is, in terms of pricing content, it's so important to understand you won't make profit, at least not now. It's going to take time. To break even is already incredibly difficult. So this is a long-term investment. And this is not to scare you. It's just to prepare for the next couple of years understanding that you're part of such an amazing push for growth it's going to 
be a little bit of a sacrifice to start, but it's going to have so many great returns later on. And so you have to understand, what's the value proposition? How much do I want to put in? How much do I want to get out of it? And how much are consumers willing to pay for this experience? And that's a difficult question to answer. So as we start to see more and more success among different types of content, different games, we'll start to see how those prices will come into play. And we already can tell there are certain games that can sell for $30, $40 successfully. And there are some experiences that are just too short or just not as immersive as those more expensive games and can't be priced out that much, even though it's cost the developer so much to build. So there, there is you know, a need to understand how that works. As I mentioned, there are advertising brands who are selling their content. Um, so Gatorade did something like this. And, and there are a few other projects that I've heard about from bigger brands that are trying to not only understand, you know, get out there, get in front of the VR consumer, but understand how that consumer is paying. So it's not necessarily that Gatorade wants to profit. It's the fact that these brands are going to understand how many people, if they put something compelling out there, and they don't even put their brand on it until you buy it, how many people are going to buy that, that content? So brands are really putting in a lot of effort into this, which is great. It's promising, and it's going to help with monetization once we kind of get that worked out. And so speaking of brands and advertising, there are a number of ad networks that are coming out and coming into play. And we're starting to learn how advertising can be used in VR. So these are just a few, and they've done some great projects, and there are plenty more. And so there are a few things that need to be understood. What platform you're developing for and what platform these networks are on. Not all of them are on every platform. And also, what kind of consumer do you have? Is it the kind of consumer that responds to advertising? Or is it that hardcore gamer that's willing to get an in-app purchase and doesn't want to see an ad? So understanding your consumer in terms of building in your advertising network is key. And then, as I mentioned, VRcades are becoming a huge way to get consumers into headsets. So then when we compare 2016 to 2020, we see a huge boom. And this is just consumer revenue. This is not enterprise or software licensing. This is just what comes from consumers. And so by 2020, you're going to see $14 billion of software revenue come in. Games are going to shrink in terms of their share of that because so much more is going to come out. It's not to say that games won't grow in revenue. They just are going to be sharing more revenue. And you'll start to see media and entertainment find its place in monetization and find its way with the consumer. And social media is going to be huge. This is an immersive, interactive environment. We're still working our way through the uncanny valley and understanding how people want to interact with one another in an interactive environment and a virtual environment. But in the next five years, we're going to have a much better understanding of that. And social media has real potential in that. And so as I mentioned, understanding your consumer and consumers in general is really important. And so when we talk to consumers uh, who either already purchased a headset or were going to in the next 12 months, this is what they said they wanted to use VR for. Games is obvious, right? We know that. And we know that entertainment makes a lot of sense. But one of the things that stood out to us was these unique experiences. So you've likely all experienced something that isn't a game. It's not a show. It's something that makes you feel, but it, you don't know why. So recently, Google Earth came out and has gotten great feedback of being that kind of experience makes you feel something, something that you can't get from a 2D experience, something that puts you inside of something that can't happen in the real world. And this is a great, a great way to think about moving into VR. It doesn't have to be straightforward the way that traditional media runs. It can be new. It can be different. And identifying why you're in VR is the most important thing. You don't port a game straight from PC to VR. It's almost never going to work right. It needs to be a game that you made for that experience specifically. And that's why these, these experiences that are not quite games, not quite videos, you know, harmonics, music, VR, for example, is one of my favorites because you just sit inside of this kaleidoscope and you feel your favorite songs inside of you. And so 
that biofeedback, that's what you want to have. That's what you want to give your consumers. And then in terms of purchasing, it still is very nascent. And a lot of consumers think about you know, monetization the same way that we do, because they're not thinking outside of what, what they might want to purchase once VR is uh, more established. Uh, you know, full game purchases in VR are the most common because that's just the most common monetization model right now. And then, you know, one-off downloads and so on are after that because we know that that's likely what people are going to do to start with. They know that too. In-app purchases also have a place though. So do vanity items. In-app purchases as in uh, extended content and then vanity items being anything you would put on an avatar or something like that. So even though we're still kind of experimenting with that, consumers want that. They're willing to pay for that. And finally, removing ads. So 22% say they want to pay to remove ads. But that still means there's a significant number of consumers who are willing to get free content for ads. But you have to understand who your target is and whether they're that target that's willing to consume in that way. So finally, we're here. No more Atari, no more virtual worlds. We've come to this new horizon of VR that I'm sure all of you have been wanting since you were a child because you're here. I know for me, this, the moment that my husband introduced me to VR was the moment that I started my new life. Um, there's so much potential and excitement around it, but we need to be careful and we need to tread lightly. We need to understand the market and not just jump inside of it because there's a lot of money to be you know, invested and there's a lot of potential for this market. We're still a ways away from mass consumption. But this is the time, these next few years are when you can be the key, the key holders of the consumer and that understanding behind what it is that they want and how your content is going to be ideal for them. So take this time and look into it and research and become the best VR industry stakeholders that there are. Thank you. So we have a question right there. If you could please indicate your name and company before asking your question, that'd be great, thanks. Hi, I'm Seth Sokolow with Virtual Sky. I'm curious why you didn't include the cardboard shipment numbers in the 2016 slide that you had up and what that corresponding uh, estimate would be. It's a great question. Cardboard is tricky because it's, 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 it was an entry point for VR. It was a way for people to get inside of a, a, a cheap device that was easy to put on and have a few minutes of, of an experience. But the future is not cardboard necessarily. At this point, you can get cardboards for free or for less than $5. So we choose not to um, really focus on cardboard that much, as, as much as we do the, the hardware that's going to build the most from here, and that's going to offer the most to consumers. So there's still cardboard users, but we've found that cardboard users tend to use their cardboard for much, much, much less time. Their lifetime is smaller. Their duration of play is smaller. So that's sort of why we focused on that. Trying to identify the shipment numbers is also very tricky because there, there's cardboard and there's not, you know, cardboard made but not, you know, necessarily cardboard, right? There are these devices that are, that are almost the same or exactly the same but don't run in, you know, with, with Google specifically. So we've been trying to keep an eye out. Um, I'm trying to remember, we just changed our shipment figure to, to 80 million, something like that, 80, 85. Uh, we originally had it much lower, and it was because we were only tracking the, the Google, uh, the ones that were made by Google or made with Google, I forget what the branding is. But we've now seen, especially in Asia, just this boom of free cardboards going out, and that you know, also makes it difficult. So, you know, we, we, we think it's important, but we think it's important mostly to get people into VR and get them moving up the ranks rather than it being a long-term solution. Question here.
Hi, yes. Uh, Jonathan Reed from Timefire. Have you been able to split out with the uh, consumers when you look at their awareness and their likelihood to continue the mashup that's occurring between 360 video and VR? I'm glad you asked that. Um, we, we are. So a lot of the awareness that we've seen in the past has been strictly because of gear or Google Cardboard, especially trying the devices. So like I was just saying with Google Cardboard. The consumer, however, tends to not know that there's a difference. And so when we ask consumers, they don't necessarily know that they're aware of one over the other and that they're likely to purchase something that's specifically a headset for 360 and a headset for immersive VR. So that's been one of the challenges. But we're currently doing a consumer study um, that we're going to release at the end of January that specifically talks to consumers about that difference and then asks them you know, what their intent is and all of those things. So unfortunately, I can't answer that now. But I understand the struggle, and it's something we're working through. Any other questions? Right there. Over there. Uh, hi, uh, Chris Lai from Rogue Science. Uh, the consumer study you mentioned, will you be tracking more closely what the major barriers to adoption are in consumers in that study? Yeah, so we already are. We have, we have several consumer studies that we run, and one of them is just the general media consumer. And that one, we're identifying um, the barriers to adoption for them, and then we're also looking at those who are interested in VR and comparing them. So we're running them alongside each other, and those are quarterly. So they'll be tracking. Uh, they won't be longitudinal because it's very difficult to get the same people to respond. And there's such a small um, respondent pool for people who are interested or have a device to access. Uh, but it will be over time, so we can kind of track those changes. Right there. Uh, hi, Dan Ilström with uh, Guru Games. Um, I was wondering if you could go into a bit more detail um, uh, around the, um, the games data and how uh, different genres, uh, how popular they are in, in the game segment and how you think that will change in the future and how it's um, different between devices. Sure, great question. We found that Experiential games that are easy to, to experience without a large um, learning curve tend to be the most popular on mobile, and I think you know, that's straightforward. We found that with, with PlayStation users as opposed to PC users, uh, they don't, they're not necessarily as hardcore as those PC users. So PC users, because they're willing to spend so much on a device to power their headset, they're, they're hardcore gamers, or they're hardcore tech enthusiasts. They're going to be the ones who are more likely to move into the hardcore gaming space. PlayStation has a more agnostic group that uh, comes in for a number of reasons, because console gamers, I mean, you already likely have the console, or you know, it's not as prohibitive in cost. So we've seen um, different games and genres across the board with PlayStation. OK, last question for this one, please. Thank you. Hi, uh, Dylan Fox from Major League Baseball Advanced Media. Um, I'm curious about the 2020 models for um, social media revenue showing 16% you know, of this huge market. And I'm wondering if you see that coming largely from advertising, and if not, what other sources of revenue constitute that portion? Yeah, so re you know, advertising is definitely one of the things that we anticipate will be part of that. But we also see the potential, because you're using an avatar, we see a lot of potential for people to buy um, vanity items or per, you know, things to decorate their virtual worlds or use in a lot of ways that you see with an MMO. So we're identifying social media as kind of the cross between an MMO or an open world and a Facebook. All right, I think that's it. But thank you so much, everyone.